Okay, the next speaker is Mark Humayan. And uh, he was actually a center director when I worked there at NSF the first time about 20 years ago, I was an ERC program director. He is the University of Professor of Ophthalmology and Cornelius J. Ping's Chair in Biomedical Sciences at the University of Southern California. He also serves as the Director of the Institute for Biomedical Therapeutics, Co-Director of the Roski Eye Institute, and Director of Sensory Science Initiatives at the Keck School of Medicine at USC. Dr. Humayan. Thank you very much, Teresa. Can you hear me well? Yes, we sure can. Okay, well, uh, it's a great pleasure to be with you. Um, and I'm going to be talking about our NSF ERC called Biomomatic Microelectronic Systems, or for short, BMES. Um, you know, before I get started, I'd like to acknowledge a few key people. Um, my deputy director, James Wyland, was key throughout this ERC. I was the inaugural director and stayed with the program for the entire 10 years, and Jim was an incredible asset. I'd also like to acknowledge the wonderful people at NSF. Uh, it was nice to meet you while you were there. Also, the program managers were, were just really fun to work with, very supportive, Gil Devi, Liana Sterowitz, uh, Sohi Rastigar, just to mention a few, and of course, Lynn Preston. So uh, with that, I'll, I'll like to get started and uh, about our ERC here. Um, so, uh, the, um, uh, it, just to go back one second, uh, it was a, it was the three universities involved <clears throat> were the University of Southern California, where I am currently, as well as Caltech and UC Santa Cruz. Um, and so the vision of our biomimetic microelectronic systems ERC or BMES ERC was to develop biomimetic microelectronic systems. Uh, which will form a direct high density interface with human nervous system to restore lost function. Um, the areas we were looking at were in the retina and in the brain, and also at a cellular level, uh, connecting with neurons. And as we think about this, um, clearly we understand the impact of these devastating neurological conditions, whether it's blindness, uh, whether it's cognitive loss and Alzheimer's, um, clearly, we've seen the role of electronics and Parkinson's to reduce the uh, the tremor. Um, so this was an exciting area, but how do we, you know, develop this high density interface with the human nervous system? Uh, professionally, this was very, very ex um, challenging, exciting for me. But on a personal note, um, it was also of extreme interest to me because my grandmother. Um, who raised me went blind from diabetic retinopathy. So uh, in particular, the retinal test bed looked at uh, to develop a biomimetic microelectronic system to be able to restore sight to those who are completely blind, to be able to enable them to have independent mobility and, and orientation. Even that is of incredible importance. If you just for a second close your eyes, you realize you know, how dependent you are uh, on your vision. And uh, so being able to even provide orientation and mobility would mean a lot, but beyond that, to be able to read and recognize faces. The cortical test bed was to develop a, a system to restore cognitive function, such as formation of new memories. And as I mentioned, this, this device was aimed at the hippocampal area of the hippocampus of the brain. And the cellular test bed was to activate uh, cells individually so a lot of the electronic systems were electrode based and so they would the first two they would stimulate groups or networks of neurons how can you go beyond that and actually um, individually activate neurons so uh, for example instead of playing a keyboard with boxing gloves um, which is you can't access each individual key um, could you actually do this with the cellular test bed and get down to individual cells or akin to playing that keyboard uh, with your fingers. Um, so this was, uh, I'd like to thank Professor Wang for that wonderful introduction on ERCs. Uh, he introduced the concept of the three-plane chart. Um, as many of us struggled with this initially, but at the end, it was 
the most uh, important way to organize the center, at least in my mind. And the transformative vision was to develop these neural prosthetics um, that I just mentioned. Um, and so you can see the three test beds. We've already talked about the retinal, the brain, and the cellular, but the enabling technologies were really key engineering aspects of developing uh, bioelectronics. So there had to be a system on a chip that had to be developed. Power and data had to be transmitted into these implantable devices. And of course, these the interface technologies were such that they had to preserve and protect these microelectronics when they were in probably the most corrosive environment that they can experience, which is a warm salt water environment of our human body. And then we also had to make sure that, of course, these electronics didn't damage the neurons. Incredible. Uh, the fundamental research area you can see span from neuroscience to low power um, to uh, data compression to dealing with bioheat, again, not to damage those neurons. And so, and the output of this center was uh, clearly to develop these neural prosthetics. But what we learned from this very quickly is that if we could do these, we could also develop other implantable actuators and sensors for drug delivery and, and drug sensing. So um, one of the key things uh, Lynn Preston emphasized, and I'm very thankful to her, um, as well as uh, our program managers, was that, you know, e this is a busy slide, but each one of those um, test beds and activities couldn't, should not be a silo. They should really be integrated. And you can see here, for example, these are the icons. So you can see up, up at the top here, it looks like the eye, and this is the retinal uh, test bed. But you can see, um, you know, we had to develop a, a camera system. We had to develop a way to attach it and, 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 and implant power and recovery regulation. So we spent a lot of time developing this integration within the center. So if something were, was developed for the cortical of the brain test bed, we could also use it uh, for the eye and vice versa. Uh, so this is, uh, I'm going to spend the rest of the talk focusing more on one test bed because of interest of time, which is the retinal test bed. And this is what the system we're talking about, and I'll play this video. Um, basically, it has a camera that's uh, in this generation was worn at, in the glasses, and it would capture the image, for example, this letter E that we see at the end of a chart if we go to uh, an eye doctor, optometrist, ophthalmologist office. And then this information is sent via the camera um, and a system that is associated with the camera and the glasses uh, wirelessly, both power and data are then sent um, inductively, in this case, into the eye where um, the both information is and, and power are decoded by an implanted um, ASIC, uh, which is in this package, as we mentioned, a hermetic package. And then this information is transmitted via a very flexible electrode array to stimulate the retina. So in this case, what this is doing is, as you can see, projecting or patterning, stimulating the retina and the, and the shape of that letter E, and it's bypassing those damaged photoreceptors. This is the retina you can see in the dark uh, in this animation where the photoreceptors are damaged, but the rest of the nerve neurons are still there. And so this electrode array is stimulating the remaining neurons. So in essence, by by put by having this implantable device connect to a wearable device, you're jump starting an otherwise blind eye or blind retina into sending this information into the into the brain. Um, so the of course the the key here is the number of electrodes and how how uh, carefully you do it and 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 how many uh, individual electro uh, neurons you can stimulate. We talked a little bit about that piano scenario. So in the in 2002, when we got our ERC, uh, we were only at 16 electrodes. Um, very rudimentary device would take seven or eight hours to implant um, in surgical time. Uh, and you can see the vision was very limited. And then through the ERC, we were able to develop the 60 electrode, as you can see in this chart. So the y-axis are the vision, how the vision is improving from hand motions ultimately to 2020. Uh, and also on the other y-axis is the number of people we can help. Of course, the better the vision we can provide, the more people we can help. So initially we were just with a very rudimentary system, but with the ERC, 
um, with our ERC, we were able to, to develop a 60 electrode device, which I'll be talking about, and then also lay the grand, groundwork for the 240 electrode device, um, which really does start to improve the vision and the number of people we can help. Um, so what does this system entails is, is, as I mentioned, this camera, as you can see in the middle, with, that's worn the glasses, but also this telemetry coil that's on the glasses, as well as a video processing unit, all these are worn. And then they communicate to the implanted system, as you can see in the bottom, which has the implanted uh, antenna to receive this information, the electronic case, the hermetic case that has the ASIC, and then the electrode array. And, you know, th this turned out to be um, one of those real success stories, sort of a it was a real moonshot. Um, everybody thought that if you put electronics in the eye, it would tear up the delicate retina. And certainly with the retina having hundreds of millions of photo detectors, having only 60 electrodes would never get you anywhere near any useful vision. Um, but all that to say is, and I'll show some uh, data in just a minute, but this became the world's, and today, the only FDA-approved retinal prosthesis um, so with 60 electrodes, uh, it was able to show that there was an improvement in mobility and also being able to read large letters. Um, and other things we had to take into account, just as the last bullet, is that this implant had to be controlled. Um, and so it, it, it couldn't be an implant that would preclude getting an MRI scan, for example, because many of these patients uh, may very well need something like that off the head. Um, so a lot of thought went into it, but um, again, very exciting at the end of the day that we did have this FDA approved. And here's a video. This, pa this patient is completely blind from an inherited retinal condition called retinitis pigmentosa, which damages the photoreceptor. So starting in the 20s, you start to lose your peripheral vision. You end up with tunnel vision. And then um, by, by the age of 40 or 50 or 60, you certainly have lost most of your vision, and so you're completely blind. This uh, lady could barely see light before getting the implant, but you can see here now she's sitting at arm's length away uh, from a screen and looking at large letters. And the question we had and, and the whole community had, um, both engineering, medicine, um, was that, you know, could pattern electrical stimulation, artificial stimulation, the way we were delivering it to the remaining retinal neurons, enable an otherwise blind person to see a person who had been blind for decades. And so um, here's a video with audio, hopefully you can hear it. Uh, and this was really an exciting moment for us to be able to show that not only does this device provide the ability to see light and dark, but much more beyond that. And actually uh, blind patients can start to see forms like you see uh, in this video. So I'll play the video now for you. Yes. 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 This is gone smaller. Yes. Um, so I don't know. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. See? Yes. No? Yes. So on the bottom, on, in the black, uh, in the little inset is what the camera sees, and the green is the electrode pattern. So this really, uh, as I mentioned, the ability to see form uh, using this device really changed the perception of what these devices can do. Here's a video actually that wasn't recorded by us, but it was taken. It was recorded by BBC Television. They went and uh, recorded one of our patients using their device. Um, this is a particularly touching moment for me because this patient is actually playing with her grandson, and she told me um, that how important this device was to to get her to re-engage with her grandson. 
And of course, she was telling me these stories about being able to, to do what you're going to see. And I was ignoring it because I didn't think this was possible. Uh, but here you can see with BBC TV uh, what she's able to do. No one expects grandma to play like a professional. But for Linda Morse, that any ball goes in is amazing. She's totally blind. A small circle in her glasses with a camera and some clever electronics turns the images into patterns of dark and light. It may not sound like much, but for Linda, it's made a huge difference. And so I just would like to conclude by giving some statistics and some metrics. So um, our three ERC partner universities I've already mentioned, but we had a number of other outreach universities that played a critical role outlined here on this U.S. map in yellow circles. And then, of course, the industrial partners were key. Um, they provided various different technologies um, through our collaboration. And we also had the ability to work with national labs. And, and that was truly a, a very important aspect of this, working with various Department of Energy um, laboratories to, to see what kind of technologies they could bring to bear. Uh, we also had um, eight startup companies um, that came out of it. Professor Wang spoke about that. But before I get into the output metrics, I do want to point out the interdisciplinary nature of this. We often talk about this, um, but when I sat down and wrote this down in terms of where the faculty came from that worked in the ERC, um, that represents the percentages here you can see. Um, so, you know, obviously the health and medical sciences and bioengineering is the biggest a green circle, but again, electrical electronic communications uh, was 19%. A lot of the other disciplines were very well represented. Um, and, you know, 14 plus disciplines were, we were involved, were involved in our ERC. Uh, education was key um, to this. Professor Wang again talked about this, educating the workforce of the future. We developed 14 new courses, a new curricula uh, uh, in uh, these sorts of neural interface uh, devices, neural prosthetics. And you could see the number of students. There was an enormous interest in this and continues to be from a lot of a lot of um, students uh, of various, uh, from various backgrounds. Of course, we didn't stop at the undergraduate and graduate level. We had a very robust outreach to um, K through 12 programs um, here in Los Angeles, where I am. Uh, many of these students had had never even had an access to a computer uh, as, as staggering or as, as that, that fact is. Um, and many had never been, many in their um, families have never been to college. And so we really changed that metric, had a number of them uh, start to go to colleges, reputable colleges. And you can see we impacted, you know, more than uh, 2000 K through 12 students during the duration of, of our engineering research center. Um, so over, in terms of productivity, if you can see here, um, you know, clearly this is a snapshot at year eight, but we had, um, as I mentioned, a number of 17 industrial partners, seven or eight startups, um, number of patents filed, 177, and licenses issued were pretty uh, good too at 20, um, and various invention disclosures, and of course, publications um, of 325 uh, at that period. So uh, very active, very robust center. Um, and, you know, we continue to develop new technologies in this space. So we have uh, transitioned our um, BMES ERC into, into an institute, um, which is the Ginsburg Institute for Biomedical Therapeutics. Um, it's well endowed. It's doing very well. And biomimetic microelectronic system is really one of the core pieces of our institute here at University of Southern California. Um, and we're working on technologies such as this, for example, an implantable camera inside the eye instead of having the camera be worn on the glasses. Um, so um, hopefully through this brief presentation, um, you know, I've shown how education industry and outreach are really critical aspects of um, any uh, NSF ERC and particularly ours. Uh, it, was, it was incredibly important to bring the various pieces together, uh, both at the systems level, at the testbed level, and, and as well as the enabling technologies level. And through that, we were able to develop 
this new therapy FDA approved the very first and the only retinal chip implant to restore sight to the blind uh, to address a, a, a compelling need of blindness for these patients. So in conclusion, you know, biomimetic microelectronic systems with the neural systems are with the neural system are incredibly challenging. Um, but of course, if we could do it, it has the unique advantages of restoring neural function to potentially millions of patients for whom there's no foreseeable cure. So this continues to be our focus. And I'm so thankful that the NSF and through the NSF ERC, we were able to get uh, this jump start on into this area and develop the very first product. And of course, in addition to NSF, once NSF stepped in, then other agencies, as I mentioned, Department of Energy, National Eye Institute, uh, state foundation, philanthropic and commercial funding were critical to develop this technology. And in doing so, not only develop this technology, but train the required for workforce to engineer and commercialize these technologies in the future as well. Uh, so with that, um, I would like to conclude my talk and take any questions. That's a beautiful presentation. Thank you so much. Um, I have several questions myself. Um, and if I ever turn off my camera, it's my bandwidth. So um, I'm going to try to get that addressed during the break. Let me uh, begin. Uh, I'd like to ask questions about your work, but also because there are students in the audience as well, you have an MD PhD. And I noticed all the part, you know, the academic partners you had in the disciplines. Can you say something about that type of formal training? Because many universities are still just launching MD PhD programs and how that really um, enhanced your perspective and what you were trying to do and succeeded. Well, clearly, you know, MD PhD is, is a long road. Um, it adds, uh, you know, 10 years to your training after you get out of undergraduate. So uh, it isn't something, you know, people think about that timeline and, and are concerned about it. But I, I can tell you that it was absolutely necessary for me to have both degrees. There's, there's no way I could have done what I knew in medicine um, and developed this device or vice versa. And so I still remember sitting there and, um, you know, trying to speak with engineers about sodium potassium and try to understand the PN junction in reverse. Uh, they're just such different languages. And so I think for, for this particular case and those interested in engineering and medicine, I would strongly encourage that you get a fundamental, very strong foundation in both. And to me, that was best achieved through the MD PhD track. It was it was longer, but in the end, it ended up shortcutting a lot of the difficulties one could have faced. Certainly, I could have faced because the two languages are so different. The language of medicine and engineering are, are profoundly different. And so, I would encourage everyone who's listening to, if you want to make a profound difference, to certainly do that. And if you can't for whatever reason, then then you have to work very, very, very closely with others and practically live with them, uh, quote unquote, to um, to really learn the language and be have a symbiotic relationship. But in my case, um, this technology was so early, um, you know, ophthalmology, the visual surgery, the whole medical aspect was not ready to accept anything like this. So for me, it it had to be both degrees. But thank you for asking that question. It was a well, tough decision in my career. Thank you so much.